let's start the today's program. So we are very happy to have Professor Oscar Diaz from the University of Southampton with us. And uh, Oscar is a well-known expert in anything to do with uh, relativity, black hole physics, and particularly the mathematical questions related to the general relativity. And we are very happy and grateful that he has accepted our invitation and agreed to give a seminar. So Oscar, the stage is yours. Oh, thank you very much. So first of all, really thank you to, to for this kind invitation. As I was telling before, you know, this is the first time that um, that I visit India, although just virtually. And it's really a pleasure because you have such a scientific tradition, an historic scientific tradition that uh, that it's really a pleasure to do, to join you today. So today what I want to do is to uh, talk about what happens when we dive into the interior of an asymptotically flat airy black hole. What do I mean by airy black hole? I mean a black hole that has a, a charged scalar field condensate floating above the event horizon. And as we will see, this can happen if I start with a Rice and Austin black hole and I perturb it with a scalar field. This, this, this Rice and Austin black hole under these conditions can become unstable to the condensation of a scalar field that stays floating above the event horizon because basically the electromagnetic or the electric repulsion uh, will balance the system against the gravitational collapse. And then such a black hole like Rice and Austin will have two horizons. It will have the event horizon like Schwarzschild, but on top of that, it will have also a Cauchy horizon that is inside the event horizon. And we will see that once the black hole, the scalar field condensates in this uh, background, uh, actually the Cauchy horizon will be replaced by uh, what we call a Kasner, which is a space-like type of singularity. Okay, very well. So this is work based on this is this 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 seminar is based on work that I have done with with Gary Arovitz and with George Santos. So Gary is in Santa Barbara in California, and George Santos is in Cambridge. And uh, I will also mention briefly in the end uh, a result from Mark Eno that which is a result that came after after our paper. And, uh, and that has a lot of relevance for the, the study that I will describe today. Please do interrupt me at any point. I don't see, unfortunately, I don't see your faces. So I will not see you making movements if you, if you try to interrupt me. So please just unmute yourselves and ask me any question that you might have during this talk, okay? Thank you. Okay, very well. So, uh, let me let me move. Let, let me start by giving an overall motivation for the study that I will describe today. So <clears throat> the main question that we want to address today is what happens when we dive across an event horizon into the interior of a black hole, especially when this black hole, like the Rice and Nordstrom or the Kerr black hole, is one that has a Cauchy horizon. Well, we know that this question raises many classical and quantum questions, mm -hmm. most of which are not yet fully understood. Already along the last decades, we have been understanding a little bit about, about them. So I would say that there are two main blocks of, uh, of, uh, of ideas that have been explored related with this question. The first block, is ultimately related with the way we approach a space-like singularity, and it's also related with the weak cosmic censorship. So already in the 70s, Hawking and Penrose were the first ones that, once we are stating that once we are in the interior of a black hole, the space-time should inevitably end on a singularity. But this was, this was a, a general comment about the global structure of the space-time. Uh, and then the devil is on the details. And in particular, what happens when we approach this singularity was something is a question that 
is in the mind of people since uh, since uh, many decades. Actually, I think that the first one to raise this question was Landau in 69 or 59. Now I don't remember exactly. And the first people that addressed this were Belinsky, Kalanikov, and Lifshitz in, in 69 or in the 70s. And this is the famous BKL uh, series of papers where they basically say that when we are approaching a space-like or also known as cosmological singularity in their papers, the general solution that describes the approach to such a cosmological singularity is very intricate and typically described by what we call a Kasner cosmology. So this is an exact solution of Einstein equations. And this approach to this space-like uh, uh, space -like singularity, usually it's, very, it's really very elaborated and it can even lead to what is known in the literature as the cha chaotic BKL oscillations in the fields. Don't worry if you are not familiar with these names, Kasner cosmology or chaotic BKL oscillations because we will have an opportunity to describe them later. Related with this question of what happens when we dive into the interior of the uh, black hole, in 79, Gerwak and, Ger and Arovitz, they have proposed the so-called weak cosmic censorship conjecture that basically states that in very short terms, it st states that naked singularities should not be allowed to form in a physical process. For example, during a gravitational collapse, it should not be possible to form naked singularities that are not hidden by an horizon. So we see that uh, looking to what happens once when we dive into the interior of a black hole is a question that has been explored already since the 70s. Related also with this question of what happens when we dive into the interior of the black hole, Gerak, Penrose, and Christodoulou have also been worrying about the question of what happens when our black hole, besides having an event horizon, what happens if it also has a Cauchy horizon, a winner horizon? And, uh, and the, the existence of this Cauchy horizon, for example, in the Rice and Nordstrom or in the Kerr black hole, is something that is, if we think a little bit about it, it's a little bit worrying. Because the fact that this Cauchy horizon exists means that when we cross, we cross this Cauchy horizon, we should enter a region where we lose classical predictability of the Einstein equations because it will not be giving initial data, will not be enough to predict what happens in the interior of a Cauchy horizon. And in particular, Penrose has been quite worried with with this problem. And at a certain point in 79, he proposed that Cauchy horizons should not really exist. They should be just artifacts of some highly symmetric solutions that should not form from, from the gravitational collapse of generic initial data. And in particular, he proposed the, a famous blue shift instability effect that should be responsible for producing a singularity that would replace the Cauchy horizon. And because we would have a singularity instead of the Cauchy horizon, we would not be able to cross the Cauchy horizon into that region of the space time where it would no longer be possible to predict uh, what, what happens in the in, in, there just from initial data. And these, these ideas have been made more precise precisely by Penrose in 79 and later by Christodoulou in a reformulation of the conjecture in what is known as the strong cosmic censorship conjecture that essentially states that generically, meaning for generic initial data, it should not be possible to extend the solution across the Cauchy horizon of, uh, of the solution. So some kind of singularity should appear in the place where the would be Cauchy horizon uh, was expected to appear. Okay. And I should, I should emphasize that we have here what is known as the strong cosmic censorship and we have the weak cosmic censorship conjecture. And the two of them are independent of each other. And in particular, 
the one does not imply the other one, okay? In spite of the names that might suggest it. So for example, here on the left panel, I'm giving an example of a situation that violates the strong cosmic censorship, but not weak cosmic censorship. What, what do we have here? We have here some origin of our space time. We have the past null infinity. We have the future null infinity here. And then we have here an horizon. And now what happens is that if I give initial data here, I see that this initial data is not enough to predict what will happen at this point in the future that is inside of the horizon. Why is that? Because when I trace back the, the light cone, the past light cone, I find that in order to predict what will happen there, yes, I need to have this initial data, but I can also have information that is coming from here and that was not prescribed in my, in my initial data. And that would be necessary to predict what happens there. So here we have a situation where we have a violation of strong cosmic censorship. However, we don't have a violation of weak cosmic censorship because there is no naked singularity being formed. On the other hand, on this right panel, I have a situation where strong cosmic censorship is not violated. However, the weak cosmic censorship is. So again, I have the same space time with an origin here, past null infinity, future null infinity, but now instead of having a, a, an horizon there, what I have is a null singularity. In this case, I see that weak cosmic censorship is violated because we have here a naked singularity that is visible to observers that is not hidden by an event horizon for example, over there. Uh, however, there is no problem with the strong cosmic censorship because at any point on this space time, I can always predict uh, what will happen there just by giving the initial data to my system, okay? So today what I want to do is to uh, analyze a little bit in more detail what happens in the interior of a black hole when an observer dives across the event horizon of the black hole. And actually our work is not, is certainly not the first one that addresses this question. Uh, but what, I, and in particular, in the past, in recent years, people have looked at this question in asymptotically the S back one. So with a negative cosmological constant that they, is of much interest in the context of holographic, the holographic duality or the ADS-CFT correspondence. And so in particular, these authors here have, have looked to the following system. Let's suppose that we start with Rice and Nordstrom antideceter. Rice and Nordstrom in antideceter is a solution that is very much similar to the Rice and Nord asymptotically flat Rice and Nordstrom. So it has, an exterior region, which is this one here, which is the outer domain of communications outside the event horizon. The only difference with respect to the asymptotic flat case is that instead of having a past null infinity and a future null infinity, now the asymptotic region is replaced by a time-like boundary, which is this one, instead of being null. But then we have here the future event horizon and the past event horizon. And then we can cross into the interior of this event horizon. And when I cross to the interior of this event horizon, I will find the Cauchy horizon or the winner horizon. And finally, if I cross this Cauchy horizon, then I will get into another region where in the end of the day, I will find this uh, time-like curvature singularity. And so this is an example where a strong cosmic censorship seems, uh, can, be, uh, uh, can be violated apparently because I can have an observer that starts here at the outer domain of communications, crosses the event horizon, crosses the Cauchy horizon and arrives, for example, here in this region. And now we see that if I prescribe initial data along some initial space-like surface, 
This is not enough to predict what will happen there because you know, information that comes from there, from the initial hypersurface is not enough to predict what happens there because I can also have something that is coming from uh, nearby the singularity and that would be necessary to prescribe what happens there. But then what these authors have done is they have done the following. Let's add a charge scalar field to the system. If I add a charge scalar field to the system, I can, I can study the linearized Einstein equations to find that Rice and Nordstrom becomes unstable. And it becomes unstable to the formation of a scalar condensate. Now, this is a linear an analysis done at the linear level. So I'm just solving the linearized Einstein equations. But then I can see, I can also conclude that within perturbation theory, going beyond the leading order uh, or the linear order um, solution, I can back react this, lin this li uh, linear order solution to higher orders within perturbation theory. And ultimately I can even solve the full nonlinear Einstein equations numerically to find that actually associated with this uh, instability, there exists airy black holes that are a solution of the Einstein ADS equations. And these airy black holes have, with respect to the Rice and Nordstrom, they have on top of it a scalar air or a scalar field condensate floating above the horizon. Okay, and this is known in the literature for those of you that have heard of it. These solutions are known as the holographic superconductors because they play a very important role within ADS CFT, where they are dual precisely to superconductor systems on the dual quantum field theory. And then what these authors have further asked is what happens when I dive into the interior of this airy black hole? And they found that naively we would approach the Cauchy horizon very much like we did in Rice and Nordstrom. But what we find what they find is that when we approach the, the Cauchy horizon, we no longer find a Cauchy horizon. Instead of it, this Cauchy horizon turns out to be replaced by a Kasner singularity, which is a space-like singularity. So instead of having this Penrose diagram, if you want, we end up with this Penrose diagram here on the right, where I have an observer from the exterior that crosses the event horizon. And then where you would find naively the Cauchy horizon here, it is replaced by this Kasner space-like singularity. And before reaching this Kasner singularity, the system undergoes, goes through three epoch, epochs um, as they approach this singularity, okay? And I will have the opportunity to describe these three epochs in more detail later on, okay? So as I said, this is something that happens in anti-seater space-time. So the, the question that we decided to raise in our paper and that I will describe in detail today is what happens with, when we dive to, into the black hole interior of an asymptotically flat charged area black hole. So instead of being ADS, I want to ask the same question that the other authors asked, but for asymptotically flat space-times to see whether the findings that they 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 found in their in their in their research are closely connected to the fact that the, we have a negative cosmological constant or not. Okay, so what I want to do today, I want to start with Rice and Austin black hole, the asymptotical flat Rice and Austin black hole. Now I want to add a charge scalar field to my system. This charge scalar field at the linear level is just described by the Klein Gordon equation in the Reiser Nordstrom background. We will find that this Reiser Nordstrom black hole will be unstable to the scalar condensation. And then, very much like in the ADS case, we will find that this linear instability actually triggers uh, the existence of a, a novel black hole solution with scalar field that we call an airy black hole. Uh, 
that uh, that is a solution of the Einstein equations of the full Einstein equations at nonlinear level. Then I will in the first part of our talk. I will describe these area black holes and its properties. In particular, I will give an emphasis to the fact that this system has what we call, uh, as a family of solutions that we call the maximum warm holes, which is something that was not seen before. And then in the second part of, our, of this talk, I want to discuss what happens when we dive into the interior of this area black hole. And again, like in the ADS case, we will find that the system also goes through three main epochs uh, before an observer approaches a Kasner singularity deep in the, into the interior where the would be Cauchy horizon should be placed. So again, here I have an asymptotically flat uh, black hole, Rice and Austin black hole. So I have the past no infinity and the future no infinity, I have the event horizon here, the future event horizon, I have an observer that crosses the future event horizon, and then naively it would approach this Cauchy horizon. But as the observer is approaching this Cauchy horizon, we will see, see that the observer will, under, will go through these three epoch, epochs, and these three epochs will uh, make the system terminate not in this no Cauchy horizon, but actually on a Kasner space-like singularity. So the, 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 the observer will never be able to cross to this region here. Okay, very well. So now what I want to do is to start discussing the details of our system. So in part one, as I said, I want to describe the airy black holes of the theory. So let's first define what our theory is. Our theory is the Einstein-Maxwell theory with a charge scalar field. So I have here the Einstein-Hilbert term. I have here the Maxwell term, F squared, where F is the Maxwell field strength. Then I have a kinetic term for my charge scalar field with the a gauge covariant derivative. Then my scalar field can have a mass term, so with mass m. And now I'm adding here a scalar Maxwell coupling. And this scalar Maxwell coupling will play a very important role. So we see here that I have here the Maxwell field coupled with the scalar field. Okay. Now, the first thing that I want to do is to find solutions in particular black hole solutions of this theory and i'm initial i'm mainly concerned with static spherically symmetric solutions i can give an ansatz to look for the most general ansatz that describes static spherically symmetric solutions here i'm picking the gauge where the radius of the sphere is r okay so I have an ansatz for my, 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 met, my gravitational field. I have an ansatz for my Maxwell field, which has only a time component. And then I have my scalar field. Of course, one of the solutions of this theory is the one where uh, the scalar field vanishes, in which solution that is familiar to all of us. And this solution is parameterized by a mass and a charge that is related to the chemical potential of the solution, which is mu, okay? But now what I want to do next is, what happens when I perturb this Rice Nordstrom solution with a scalar field? So I will consider a scalar field that has a time dependence and radial dependence, it's still spherically symmetric because the background is time independent. I know that dt is a killing vector field of the solution and therefore I can decompose, fully decompose my perturbations uh, in this way, in the standard way, where I introduce here in this exponential factor, I introduce the frequency of the solutions. And then 
my my Klein Gordon equation or the Klein Gordon equation for this system, uh, maybe I should not call it Klein Gordon since this system has um, a scalar Maxwell coupling, but the linearized uh, equation of motion for the scalar field is described by this single ODE. Okay. And now I can study the solutions of this ODE. And what I find is that if the charge of the scalar field is such that Q squared times the chemical potential of the solution squared is smaller than the mass of the scalar field, asymptotically doing a Frobenius analysis of this equation, asymptotically, I find that I have two solutions, one of which diverges exponentially at infinity, and the other one decays exponentially at infinity. Now, this exponential decay that we see here, as R goes to infinity, is characteristic of what we call bound states. So these solutions that this decay exponentially at infinity, okay, they have kind of a wall here that traps the solutions in the interior of the, of the background. And therefore we call such type of solutions bound states. On the complementary regime, where the charge of the scalar field times the chemical potential is bigger than the mass of the scalar field, we find that the scalar field does oscillates asymptotically instead of decaying exponentially, which means in particular that it is not bound to the original Rice and Nordstrom black hole. And we can check that such solutions have infinite energy. Therefore, I must discard them. So I'm only interested on the case from now on, on this case, where the charge of the scalar field times the chemical potential of the solution is smaller or equal to the mass of the solution. Now, in such case, I can now position myself in the, in the Rice and Nordstrom configuration that is at extremality. Being at extremality means that the Rice and Nordstrom black hole has zero temperature. Or said in other words, the winner horizon coincides with the event horizon. And then I can zoom in near the horizon of this solution. This is what we call the near horizon region of the extreme horizon Austrian black hole. In order to do this zoom in around the horizon of the black hole, I do the following uh, coordinate transformation. So I look to radi radi uh, radii that is very close to R plus. So it is R plus plus a small quantity that I will call lambda and that I want it to approach zero in the, uh, ultimately. Okay. And, uh, and therefore I do this coordinate transformation along the radial direction together with this transformation in the time direction, I send lambda to zero. And what I find is that my solution reduces to the direct product of ADS2 cross a sphere. So I have here clearly the sphere. This sphere is at constant radius, clearly it's R plus. And then here we can identify a two dimensional metric that precisely is the metric of the ADS2 space time. Now, the interesting thing is that although in this limit I'm discarding higher order terms in lambda square, so I'm discarding terms of order lambda square and higher, the truth is that this solution here or this uh, geometry or metric here is still a solution of the Einstein-Maxwell scalar equation of motions of the original one. So this limiting procedure still gives me a solution of the original equations of motion, but it no longer has uh, uh, um, an horizon. It is instead what we call ADS2 cross S2. It, this is also known as the Bertotti uh, Robinson solution in the in the literature. Now, what is the reason why this is very relevant is the following. 
I don't know how much you are familiar with this, but I can also apply this limiting procedure to the original Klein-Gordon equation of my system. And if I do that, I will find that in the end of the day, the limit, the near horizon limit of this Klein-Gordon equation gives an equation of motion for an, a charged massive scalar field. But the mass of the scalar field is no longer the original mass of my system, which was this one. Instead, it is replaced by an effective mass. This is what I'm calling M effective. And now it just happens that this mass effective is the original mass basically minus a term that, um, that is proportional to the charge of the scalar field. And all of this lives in this ADS2 cross S2 spacetime. Now, what is interesting in ADS2 spacetimes is that the mass of the scalar field in ADS can be negative and we still have normalizable solutions, meaning that we, we still have solutions with finite energy, even when the mass of the scalar field is negative. So in asymptotically flat backgrounds, if I put a scalar field with a, with a mass on the background, the mass of this scalar field must be positive or zero in order to have solutions with finite energy. But in ADS, the mass of the scalar field can be slightly negative and we still get solutions with finite energy. Well, it can be negative, but not that much negative. It can be negative as long as in ADS2, as long as it is bigger than uh, minus one fourth. If the solution is bigger than minus one fourth, we have normalizable solutions with finite energy. Otherwise, uh, the energy of the solutions will be infinite. But the interesting point here is that you see that in this near region geometry, I can get an effective mass that can become smaller, although the original mass is positive or zero in the full geometry, in the full four dimensional geometry. In this near horizon geometry, I can get an effective mass that turns out to be negative, and actually it can even be smaller than this, this bound that is required to have finite energy. So I can violate this bound, which is known as the Breit-Lohner Friedman bound, or in short, the BF bound. And this can happen if my scalar Maxwell coupling is bigger than this quantity. Now, what happens in such a situation? When we have, when we have situations where my scalar field, from the point of view of the full geometry, the mass is positive. So it is not violating any, any finite energy condition. However, from the near horizon perspective, we can have a solution that violates this two-dimensional BF bound. On top of that, remember, if, if I'm at extremality where the chemical potential is equal to one, you remember that there was this condition for bound states that stated that Q squared times mu squared had to be smaller than M squared. In our case, mu squared is one. So if my scalar field is such that the charge is smaller than the mass of the scalar field, but Q and M combine to give an effective mass in ADS2 that violates the BF bound, then my system should be unstable. Why? Because from the near horizon perspective, I have the BF, my, the, the two-dimensional BF bound is being violated. So the system should not stay in that configuration. It should evolve towards some other configuration that no longer violates this two-dimensional. BF bound. And so this is an indication that we should have an instability at least at extremality. And then by continuity, uh, away from extremality, the instability should also be present at least near extremality. And actually we can confirm that this instability is indeed present by just solving the 
klein gordon equation of the system numerically we find that instability is indeed present so here i'm plotting the imaginary part of the frequency when the imaginary part of the frequency is bigger than zero the system is unstable and so here we see that here i'm plotting m the mass of the rice nostrum solution here i'm plotting charge minus the mass of the solution so this solution here describes the extremal rice nostrum black hole because that's when q is equal to m and we see that indeed at extremality the imaginary part of the frequency is positive so the system is unstable and actually this instability extends away from extremality when I move in this direction um, during a while. And in particular, I have here this red curve that has imagine frequency exactly equals to zero. This is precisely the onset of the instability. This is where the instability starts existing. So to the above this curve, the system is unstable. Okay. Now, the next thing that I want to consider is okay, very well. I just found that Rice and Nordstrom is unstable to condensation of scalar field bound states if this condition is satisfied. This means that at back reacting this linear solution to higher orders in perturbation theory, I should be able to construct a full nonlinear solution that keeps this scalar field. This means that there should exist airy black holes with this scalar field condensate floating above the event horizon of the rice and Nordstrom in such a way that there is a balance between electric repulsion and gravitational attraction to keep the system static and spherically symmetric. And actually these black holes in the limit, they should bifurcate from the onset of the rice and Nordstrom instability. So these black holes in a phase diagram of solutions where I plot in the vertical axis, I plot Q minus M. And on the horizontal axis, I plot the mass of the solution. I know that at Q equals to M, which is this zero here, I have extreme rice and Nordstrom. Then I know that extreme rice and Nordstrom exists in this green, area where Q is smaller than M. That's where Rice and Nordstrom's black holes exist. Then here, I have this blue curve that describes the onset, the onset of the instability that we just found in the previous slide. Okay, and then every black hole should exist above this onset. Okay, and actually we have solved numerically the Einstein-Maxwell scalar equations to construct these solutions. So every single brown dot that you see here, it's a numerical solution that we constructed to confirm our expectation that these airy black holes should exist. Now, these airy black holes have uh, an interesting property. Naively, we would expect that these airy black holes, they would exist starting from the onset of the instability where they merge. So onset of the instability means that at this onset, the scalar field is zero. If the scalar field is zero, the airy black hole must necessarily coincide with the Rice and Austin black hole. But then as we move up, for example, what is happening is that phi is, is increasing, is non-zero and is getting bigger and bigger as we go up. Now, these solutions will not exist for any charge. They will stop at a certain point. So for small mass, meaning for mass smaller than this, what happens is that the black hole stops on this black curve. What is this black curve? This is a curve that describes singular solutions. Singular solutions because the entropy of these solutions goes to zero. So the event horizon of these solutions goes to zero. Moreover, these solutions also have zero temperature. These are what we call extremal black holes, but they are extremal singular black holes because the entropy goes to zero. So we get a naked singularity. 
Now, what is interesting in this system? So this is something that we were expecting from similar systems with scalar condensation. But what is new in this system is that if the mass of the system is above a certain critical mass, what happens is that the black holes will exist from the onset of instability all the way up to a new solution, a family of one parameter family of solutions, that is this red solution. That is the, la the solution with the largest charge for a given mass, clearly. And what is interesting with these solutions is that these solutions, unlike the black ones here, they are non-singular because the entropy is finite. And on top of that, they also have non-zero temperature. Moreover, as I go along this curve from the left to the right, so as the mass is increasing, I see that the temperature and the entropy of these solutions are also increasing. So here, we have what we call a maximal warm hole. Why maximal? Maximal because it's the solution that has largest Q in, for a given M. In that sense, it's the maximum one. Warm because it has non-zero temperature, so it's warm. It has, it's not cold like this one at, the, at zero temperature. So naively, in scalar condensation problems like this one, what we would have is that this black curve would be black everywhere. So every black holes would exist always between the onset and a black curve that describes extreme or singular black holes. But this theory that we are studying with that particular scalar Maxwell coupling is special because uh, instead of having an extreme black hole for large mass, we have a maximum warm hole. Okay. Then we can ask why do maximum warm holes exist in this particular theory, but in not in other theories? And the reason is the following as one is increasing Q here, okay, for a fixed mass. The region near the horizon behaves typically as a black hole with scalar air and wants to become singular, which happens along this black curve. However, in our case, when M is large enough, when M is to the right of this critical M, before we, the system can reach the singular horizon, we have this asymptotic bound state condition that gets saturated. So the, the system is evolving towards, let's say, the black curve would be there. It's trying to reach that black curve. But before it reaches that black curve, at that point over there, we find that this condition for the bound state is saturated. So the system, the, the, the scalar field can no longer be bounded. It has to stop there. And it stops there at zero temperature, at a finite temperature because the zero temperature configuration would be that one, but it falls short to reach it, okay? So the would be extreme of black hole now has zero temperature, okay? So this is a new kind of extreme of black hole in the sense that it's the maximum black hole that we can have, but because it has finite temperature, we call it a maximum warm hole. So now I, I will start part two of this talk, which is what happens when we dive into the interior of the black hole that I just described to you. So this black hole that I just described to you, it has the event horizon. So this is infinity, let me call it like this. This is H plus and naively it would also have the Cauchy horizon or the winner horizon H minus. And now, so I mean the exterior of this black hole and I want to dive into the interior and I want to approach this Cauchy horizon, okay? I want to happens, what happens to this an observer that dives into the interior of this event horizon? And we will conclude that instead of the would be Cauchy horizon, will become a Kasner space-like singularity. So it will not exist. It will be replaced. Instead of having this would be Cauchy horizon, the system will develop a space-like singularity. So let me go now through the details. First of all, let me right away give you a theorem 
that proves that when we have a scalar field, when we have a scalar field, there can be no winner horizon, no Cauchy horizon. For that, I need an ansatz to study the black hole interior. The ansatz that I propose is this one, where Z is the radial coordinate. And Z is such that infinity is at Z equals to zero. And the would be Cauchy horizon is at a very negative Z. Okay, so I have the event horizon at ZH. I have the winner horizon at, at, uh, at ZI. Okay, so the, the, the more negative Z becomes, the closest I am to the winner horizon. Now, looking to the equations of motion of my system, of my action for these ansatz, I find that there is a quantity that is conserved, meaning that there is an equation of motion that says that dz of a certain quantity c1 must vanish, and therefore c1 must be a constant, where c1 is given by this expression here. So this follows only from the equation of motion. I have an equation of motion that says the variation of c1 where c1 is given by this must vanish when I'm walking along the radial direction. Now let's assume that our system has two horizons. It has the event horizon, but it also has a winner horizon. I know that F, this F that appears here, must, or there, must be zero at the horizons, okay? Moreover, I know that F must be negative in between the event and winner horizon. Because outside the event horizon, it is positive, then it is negative in between the two event horizons. And this in particular implies that the derivative of F at the winner horizon is necessarily positive. And this is very important. Now, it also follows directly from the equation of motions that phi must vanish at the horizon. So phi is the Maxwell field. At the horizons, the equation of motion tell me that the Maxwell field must vanish. When I insert this condition here in C1, at the event horizon, I set phi equals to zero here. I conclude that C1 in this case is simply given by this quantity. And this quantity is smaller than zero because the derivative of f at the event horizon is negative. On the other hand, if I introduce this condition again in C1, but this time at the winner horizon, I find that, so this guy is still zero. I find that this time, so here in this case, this term also vanishes because we are integrating between the event horizon and the event horizon itself. So this integral vanishes at the event horizon. But now at the winner horizon, this integral does not vanish. Oh, this second term vanishes, but not the first, neither the third term. But now recall that this guy is necessarily positive. And so is this guy. So altogether, this C1 must be bigger than zero. So at the event horizon, I know that C1 must be negative. At the winner horizon, I know that C1 must be positive. But C1 must be a constant from the equations of motion. So we get a contradiction. But this contradiction simply says that our assumption that there is a winner horizon is false. So we assume that it was present, but it cannot be present. So in the presence of a scalar field, we have shown that we can have no winner horizon. So if we can have no winner horizon, so going back to the previous slide, I already know that this winner horizon cannot be there. Very good. But if it cannot be there, what replaces it? What happens when I try to approach it? What happens to my background? Okay. And that's the question that I want to address in the next slides. So what happens when we dive into the interior of an airy black hole? 
as I have been saying from the very beginning, and this is an upshot of what is coming, the would-be winner horizon is replaced by a Kasner singularity, which is a space-like singularity as Z goes to infinity. Okay? And during this process, an infolding observer that crosses the event horizon will experience three epochs. The first one is what we call the collapse of the Einstein bridge. The second one is what we call the Joseph, Josephson oscillations epoch on the condensate. And the third one is what we call the Kasner cosmology epoch. So the first two epochs happen very near the event horizon. So once I dive across the event horizon, very near this event horizon, but already in the interior, the observer will go through these two stages. Then the Cos Kessner cosmology phase, it's a very long phase as we are trying to approach the would be winner horizon that would be somewhere here. Now, sometimes we have a single Kessner cosmology phase, but other times, we have transition, transition, transitions to new Kasner cosmologies. And this is what is happening here, okay? And here I'm plotting the behavior of, for example, the time-time component of the metric. So what I want to describe next is, I, I want to explain in detail this plot that here I'm just explaining it in a rush. I'm just giving a, a very generic overview. Now I want to go into the details of this. Of course, this is what will dictate what happens to our system. I have here the Maxwell equation of motion for phi. Here, this is what is known as the Josephson current. Then I have here the equation of motion for my scalar field. And then here I have equations of motion for the two functions that appear in my metric. Now, I can certainly solve this system of equations of coupled ODEs numerically. But what is interesting here is that we can also solve these equations analytically as long as we do certain approximations. And this is remarkable. Well, because this system of equations is highly nonlinear. Moreover, it is clearly a coupled system of four ODEs. Nevertheless, under certain uh, educated uh, approximations, we will be able to solve the truncated equations, truncated because, or mutilated equations, because they will have some terms that I will neglect that I will be able to solve analytically. And actually, just as a side note, this is actually the spirit of the original Belinsky leaf sheets or BKL analysis. So what is the procedure to understand analytically the problem? Well, first of all, we will use the numerics to find which terms in the equations of motion are relevant for the three stages. So we will use the numerics to identify which of these terms, for example, this one, this one, when can I neglect them and when I cannot neglect them. So the terms that are relevant, I will keep. The terms that I can neglect, I will drop them. And when I drop them, I have truncated or motivated approximated equations of motion that have the advantage that I will be able to solve them analytically. In the end of the day, I will look to the analytical solutions, compare them with the numerical solutions of the full equation of motion and check that the approximation is indeed good so that the procedure is self-consistent. I should also say that the three epochs that I described briefly in the previous slide and the approximated analytical solutions that I will describe, are more cleanly identified when the scalar field is very small. Scalar field very small means, if you remember, means that we are near the onset of the instability, right? At the onset of the instability, 
phi is precisely zero. The scalar field vanishes. And then when I move away from the onset of the instability, and the, so the onset of the instability in particular happens at a certain critical temperature. So it defines me a one per meter family of rice and arson solutions that are parameterized by, by, by the mass and they have fixed temperature, okay? Now, the amazing thing is that although these three epochs and the approximate analytical solutions that we will describe are better identified when the scalar field is small. The amazing thing is that although the scalar field starts small, it will nevertheless destroy the linear horizon. So it's not that you need to have a very strong scalar field to destroy the Cauchy horizon, okay? So now what do I mean by these mutilated equations of motion? Well, I mean, something like the following example. During the first two stages, the first three epochs, and actually quite often during the Kasner period, what will happen is that we can numerically verify and a posteriori justify that the mass terms of the scalar field, so these mass terms here and here and here, can be neglected, can be dropped. And actually, there is also a charge scalar term here that I can check that is very neglectable during the first two periods of the evolution. The amazing thing is that when I draw up these terms and some other approximations that are described in detail in our original paper and that I will skip here, I end up with mutilated equation of motion that I can solve analytically, okay? So let me go now through the three stages that an observer goes through when it enters the event horizon. First of all, uh, could you tell Oscar? me how much more time? Yeah, how much more time do I have? Yeah, maybe five or ten minutes. Okay, sure. Not more than that, yeah. for sure. Okay, so the say it again. Yeah, sure. Please. please okay. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, so the first epoch is what we call the collapse of the Einstein-Rosen bridge. Usually when I, for example, in Rice and Nordstrom, when I go into the interior of the, the event horizon, I would expect that the time-time component of the metric would vanish linearly as I would approach the winner horizon. But what I find, what my mutilated equation of motion and the numerical equations uh, and the numerical solution of the full equations of motion tell me is that instead of having a linear vanishing of GTT as I approach the would be winner horizon, I see instead a rapid collapse or an exponential collapse to an exponentially small value. And this is what I'm plotting here. We see GTT, we cross here the event horizon we are approaching the would-be winner horizon. And what happens is that we see that GTT is going to zero exponentially fast instead of linearly. We call this collapse to exponential small value of GTT. We call it the collapse of the Einstein-Rosen bridge. Okay, because basically GTT sets the measure for the spatial time coordinate that runs along the warm hole that connects the two exteriors of the black hole. So when I have my black hole, right, like here, I have here the two exteriors of the black hole, this one and this one. And then I have here my warm hole region or the Einstein-Rosen bridge. So the, the rapid decrease of GTT can be thought of as a collapse of the Einstein bridge, okay? As an example, and at the same time, we also see that the scalar field starts small and it tends to increase. And then we will notice that it reaches a maximum. Pay attention to this because I will see what comes after this maximum in the next slide. Here, the solid line represents the numerical solution to the full equation of motion, and the dashed line is the analytical solution of the motivated equations of motion. So we see that the two, the, the, this analytical solution is indeed a good approximation to the full solution. 
both for GTT and for the scalar field, especially after a certain Z, right? After this one. So this is the first epoch. What is the second one? The second one, you can already an anticipate here what is going to happen. You see that we reach a maximum. And now what will happen is that we will have several oscillations here. And this is what I'm showing here. I have the scalar field, the scalar field. And we see that when I go even deeper to the interior of the black hole, the scalar field starts oscillation like hell. And this is what we call the Josephson oscillation phase of the scalar field, of the condensate, of the scalar condensate. So in this regime, what is special is that the derivative of the Maxwell field is small, very small. So we can do a further motivation in my equations of motion if I want to solve them analytically. And I find that in that case, the scalar field is described by Bessel functions. And Bessel functions, of course, they oscillate. Okay. At the same time, the metric component, if you want, not exactly the metric component, but F prime times Z divided by F, as these wiggles, that is, if you want, the back reaction of these oscillations on the black field on the gravitational field. Again, you see the solid line is the full, the solution of the full equations of motion, numerical solution, and the dashed line is the analytical solution of the motivated equations of motion, and you see that they match quite well. Okay. Then let's go to the next phase. So the next phase, what happens is that here at large Z, when I look to the scalar field, I find that at large Z, the scalar field, ah, sorry, starts behaving logarithmically. So the scalar field for large Z starts behaving like a constant beta times log of Z where beta takes a particular value that we know very well what it is. Now, when I plug this phi in, in, in my equations of motion, I find that then F and chi, which are the gravitational fields in my metric and sets, they have a particular dependence on Z. So here it's a power law dependence and chi, chi was appearing as exponential of minus chi, is log of z. So exponential of minus chi becomes also polynomial in z. Actually, all metric components become powers of z. OK? And initially, the Maxwell potential is negligible initially. I will discuss what happens if this is not the case. Now, I can introduce this proper time which, because I'm in the interior of the event horizon, is described by the Z component. And this proper time is precisely the polynomials that are appearing here, or it's proportional to these polynomials. And when I introduce this proper time and I plug it back in my original metric, I find that my original metric in terms of the proper time becomes this solution that is polynomial in the proper time with certain exponents here that are given by these quantities. But this is precisely the Kasner solution. It's the solution of the Einstein equations that describes um, the Kasner cosmology. And what is important in this Kasner cosmology solution is that this solution has a space-like curvature singularity at tau equals to zero, which corresponds to Z goes to infinity. So the fact that our solution approximates this one for large Z tells us that the would-be winner horizon is replaced indeed by a space-like Kasner singularity. Okay? Now, if this beta square, which is the beta that appears here in the logarithmic behavior of the scalar field, is um, bigger than one half, which means that the Maxwell field is very small from here, the system will remain described by this Kessner cosmology. And in this process, this Kessner cosmology solution describes a GTT that is always decreasing as we approach the final Kessner singularity. 
Now, what happens is that sometimes beta squared might not be bigger than one half. Actually, it can be, become smaller than one half. If it becomes smaller than one half, then there are new effects. Namely, when beta square is smaller than one half, this means that GTT, instead of being going to zero, starts increasing. But when it starts increasing, then the Maxwell field is no longer small. It also starts increasing. But now that the Maxwell field starts increasing, it will back react on the gravitational field. Okay. And it will cause a transition to a new Kasner solution that is described by a new beta. So if we plot here beta, beta initially is like this. It is smaller than one half, but the growth of the Maxwell field will cause a transition to a new beta that can now be bigger than one half. So instead of having one Kasner cosmology, I have two, I have a transition from one to the other. And now that B nu is greater than one half, now GTT will be decreasing to zero till the Kasner singularity is rigid. But sometimes this transition still gives a beta nu that is not bigger than one half. So this transition is the one that I described previously in a previous, you see, this is a case where I have beta nu after the transition. So I have an intermediate Kasner cosmology but beta square is smaller than one half. So then the system will have a transition to a new beta square that is now bigger than one half. And then it will approach the space-like singularity as GTT goes to zero. However, after this first transition, I can still land on a beta square smaller than one half. And this means that I will have to go have a second transition or a third transition or a fourth. Sometimes I might even have an infinite number of them in which case I have a chaotic BKL oscillatory behavior because I keep having transition, endless transitions until finally we reach a final, final, final beta square bigger than one half that makes GTT goes to zero as the Kasner singularity is rigid. All these findings are in agreement with the theorem that I proved originally. No winner horizon. There is no winner horizon when phi is present. So the presence of the scalar field destroys the possibility of having a winner arise. Okay, guys, and now I should, I, should, I should stop here and just highlight the main conclusions. So we can have airy black hole, asymptotically flat airy black holes with a scalar field floating above the horizon that terminate on non-singular black holes that have finite entropy and finite temperature. And they have maximal charge, so I call them maximal. Maximal because they have maximal charge for a given mass and warm holes because they have a non-zero temperature. And then we have shown that the airy black hole in the interior is very compli complicated. In particular, a falling observer goes through, through three stages before approaching a final space-like Kasner singularity that replaces the wood beaker shear horizon. So the scalar field destroys the wood beaker shear horizon and it gets replaced by a space-like Kisner singularity. Okay, guys, so I should stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Das, for such a very nice talk. And it's now time for questions. So any participants having any questions, please unmute yourself. I will keep for a while the, the screen, the PDF. Sure, sure, sure. Just in case there is a particular question about the screen. I, I guess you cannot see my, 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 my face, do you? No, we can help, but I think that, that's that, okay. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So there is a question uh, from Tatiana. Tatiana, can you unmute yourself and ask? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, it's a very actual question about black holes in uh, our time. Uh, but I would like to ask you about uh, um, one uh, part of your uh, talk was connected with uh, um, consideration uh, from the very beginning uh, of um, uh, such situation when uh, energy can be infinity. I know, uh, it was uh, before part two, it was uh, considered the metric when you considered three epochs and uh, uh, you 
considered some uh, metrics, and uh, then you you have said that uh, if uh, ta -ta -ta, uh, the energy of black hole will will be infinity, but we know that. Uh, it is impossible for, for real black holes because uh, there is uh, so known uh, uh, energy conservation. Uh, so what can you, um, I, I understand that you uh, said about uh, your construction, mathematical construction, but maybe you can say, say several words about uh, this um, um, transition. So but then let me see yeah. if I understood correctly your question. So are you referring, for example, to this phase diagram where we see that the, the mass of the black hole can be as large as you want? Is this the point that you are referring to or, or are you referring to the energy of the scalar field? Of the scalar field, uh, but... Uh, but uh, you said about uh, it was um, earlier um, picture uh, slide uh, earlier, and uh, but the energy of the scalar field. Uh, you didn't said about the energy of the scalar field. You said about the energy of black hole, as I as I remember. Uh, yes, so yes. You, do you refer here? Oh, sorry. Ugh. Yes, yes. Some, you refer uh, yes. this one, right? Mm -hmm. So here, yes, what yes, happens yes. is that. I can compute when I have a scalar field on a given background, right? I can compute the Hamiltonian of this associated with this scalar field. So it has a kinetic term that is proportional to the gradient of the scalar field square. And then it, it has uh, a term, a potential term associated with it. So the potential term is the term that includes, the, for example, the contribution from the mass of the solution. Now, what happens is that if this condition occurs, if this condition occurs, I find that this Hamiltonian or this energy explodes, diverges. And I don't want to consider such solutions as you are saying. My scalar field cannot have infinite energy. So I discard this situation. So I don't look to these solutions anymore. I don't analyze them further at all. I will stay with this case where we have exponential decay and therefore, so my, my scalar field. So this case here, if you want, if you have yes. here the radial direction, this is oscillating. And so if you want the integral of the energy, if you put here somehow the, the integrand of your energy, the integrand of your energy, let me call it little e, the integrand would be infinite, but essentially because this is oscillating and never stopping as r goes to infinity. So I discard it. Is this does this clarify your question? Yes, or yes, you... yes, certainly. Yes, thank you very much. I, I okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, any other uh, questions from the audience? So may I ask a question, Oscar? Yes. 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 Sure. So this appearance of this BKL singularities, I mean, you remember that there was this old BKL conjecture. The, the B, BKL? BKL? Conjecture. The BKL. Yeah, that near the yeah. singularity, only the time derivatives are important, the space derivatives are not important. Oh, careful, careful with that statement. That statement <laughs> is not totally accurate. Is not totally accurate. Uh, it's true that in certain systems, that statement is correct, okay? No doubt. But in general, yeah. both the time derivatives and some, some, some spatial gradients are important, okay? So it's not true that only the time derivatives are important. For some systems, it's the time derivatives and some gradients, some special gradients. Actually, it's so much like that, that it's actually the special gradients that are responsible for this, for this, where do I have it? For this chaotic BKL oscillatory behavior. You know, so in the BKL analysis, what you have to do is to do a kind of a mutilation of the equations of motion 
you know, if you want in the same spirit of what I did, you have to try to look to the equations of motion and identify what are the terms that are really that really contribute when I approach uh, the, the cosmological or space-like singularity. And BKL did an amazing job because they identified these terms, I can drop them and I keep only these ones. And the ones that they keep are time derivative terms, as, as, as you are saying, but uh, it also includes some, some, uh, some important spatial gradient terms in general. I understand. Then, it, it, then it's true that for particular systems, you know, it's really only the time derivative terms that contribute. And these are, is in particular the case when you have systems that don't have this chaotic BKL oscillatory behavior, precisely because they don't have these spatial gradients. Okay. It's also true, if I remember correctly, that you can rewrite your system so you can move to a different frame. So you can do some coordinate transformations. Don't ask me for the exact details, okay? Because here I don't remember this in detail. But it's true that even for these systems where the time derivatives and the spatial gradients contribute, it is possible for you to do some coordinate transformations that introduce a new time that absorbs the spatial gradients on it. And in the end of the day, you still have a description where only time derivatives in this new time contribute, okay? Does this, is this clear? Yeah, thanks a lot, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and I should say, if you want to clarify this, there is a very nice book on, on the Cambridge Press that is called Cosmo, um, Cosmological Singularities. Um, written by written by Eno uh, Eno and who is the other I don't remember the other author but at least you have one so this is from Cambridge Press and uh, and you see the, the, this this book is called precisely cosmological singularities and therefore it discusses precisely the BKL the BKL system. It starts with the BKL system, and then actually it it, 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 say, it describes that the BKL dynamics, you know, as an effective description in terms of what is called the cosmological billiard. And you can find a discussion of these spatial gradients. You can see how how important these spatial gradients are. And actually, if I remember correctly, the book starts precisely. You know, by calling the attention, careful because there is this conjecture that the, in BKL systems the time derivatives are the only one that are really important. But this is not correct. At least it's misleading Thank because you. special gradients are very important. I'll definitely look at it. Thanks a lot. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, there are no further uh, questions uh, from the audience. So uh, let me thank uh, Professor Oscar Das once again for such a nice presentation and informative talk. So thank you, thank you very much for uh, being here. Thank I'm you. the one that I'm the one that really thanks you and uh, really thank you very much for this kind of opportunity. And I hope you all the best and uh, keep safe because you, you know we might visit us anytime you want. Thank you very much. You know, hopefully, hopefully we will not get killed by COVID and by this war <laughs> that is happening in Europe. <laughs> See you. Bye-bye.